The enemy's weak against wind. When Atlas released Persona 5 back in 2016 and 2017, there was immediate chatter among the fanbase regarding a remake of an older game from the franchise. Persona 3 was regularly pushed forward as the main frontrunner for that decision. From the outside, it might seem strange to ignore nearly 10 years worth of history regarding Persona 1 and 2, but Persona 3 was the obvious choice for fans and for Atlas themselves. While Persona 1 and 2 laid the blueprints for the franchise, Persona 3 was the first game to fully realize the formula that's carried forth the now revered JRPG series. Series. From an immediate first glance, Persona 3 looks recognizable to anyone familiar with the series from Persona 4 or 5. It introduced social links, which are NPCs with their own personal stories that develop the more you spend time with them. They're the closest thing to narrative side missions you'll find in these games, and they also provide more depth for your primary party members. But beyond that new mechanic, Persona 3 also laid the foundation for other elements in the series as well. Flashy and bold UI design, and music that takes inspiration from modern day genres such as hip-hop, pop, and jazz. Many of the elements you'll find in the most recent release of the franchise can be traced right back to Persona 3. I first played through Persona 5 back in 2018, and I think it's an incredible game that made me a fan of the series. I played through the PSP port of Persona 3, known as Persona 3 Portable, which is the version that Atlas has released on modern consoles and PC. It can be somewhat considered a demake, since it trades the explorable hub areas and more lively cutscenes for static images and backgrounds that would feel right at home with any other visual novel, which is somewhat fitting given Atlas's history with many of their games being visual novel hybrids of puzzle, strategy, and simulation games. Persona 3 Portable also loses the expanded epilogue that came with the remastered re-release of the original game, Persona 3 FES. What Persona 3 Portable does have is an extra female protagonist, as well as improved gameplay mechanics that are more in line with the modern releases. From a gameplay perspective, it makes sense why Atlas has chosen this version to be the modern representation for this game, as well as it being the latest release among Persona 3. Although I believe fans are upset that the epilogue was never included with Persona 3 Portable. I played through the game on hard difficulty, and I'll circle back to the consequences of that choice later. Persona 3's greatest strength is shared among all the other Persona games. The gameplay loop of time management social sim elements as an ordinary high school student in Japan is juxtaposed wonderfully with the fantastical dungeon crawling that's reminiscent of Pokemon. Everything ties together towards improving your relationships with the characters of the world and increasing the strength of your Persona, the collectible creatures that act as your means of battle. While you collect and cycle through Persona on your journey, your party members keep the same ones that grow over time. During the day, increasing your social links and personal stats all work towards improving your persona and performance in battle. Decisions are important since your time is limited, so the time management is the hook that keeps me playing. Time limits and calendars are a mechanic that can be controversial if not done carefully, but I think Persona handles it very well. Your party members range from serviceable to very interesting, and I enjoyed every moment where the different members could interact with one another in slice-of-life moments that provided room for their different personalities to shine. With one noticeable exception, the voice cast do a great job with the characters, and emotional moments moments land quite well. Most of your interaction with your party is done in the dorm that you all reside in, and the shared dorm provides a nice change of pace from Persona 5. The narrative of Persona 3 focuses on themes of death and the meaning of life. These themes encompass each one of your party members throughout the story. Nearly every member has an experience regarding death and the loss of a loved one or friend. Each of the members have their own perspectives on death and mortality and it allows for some of the best moments of the narrative. One particular standout is when two of the party members bond over a similar experience regarding the death of a loved one in their respective lives. The overwhelming dread that comes from the subject material grows over time, and it services the story and characters very well. Death is the main focus of the story, and the ending is a wonderful bookend to that narrative. I stay down in my gamer cave and avoid the internet whenever possible, but from what I gather, Persona fans seem to believe that 3 has the best ending among the recent entries, and I see what they mean. I still think about the final scene, and the credits music has been stuck in my head for days. On the topic of music, it's another highlight that encompasses a range of different genres and moods. The battle theme, Mass Destruction, is probably the most famous song, but I was surprised to find how many of these songs that I loved. Despite Persona 3 having a bit of a shorter soundtrack than its modern sister games, despite my playtime hovering around 90 hours, I never got tired of the primary battle theme, though I didn't feel as strongly about the boss themes. The music of the regular overworld encompasses a carefree, youthful spirit that contrasts some of the heavier themes of the story, but that contrast serves to highlight the themes and music wonderfully. The static backgrounds and images of the overworld are a bit 
awkward at first due to their limitations, but I got used to it and didn't mind it as much. However, towards the end of the game, I did feel the limitations of the presentation greatly, as the narrative progressed into more dramatic and emotional story beats that could have greatly benefited from an improved presentation and actual cutscenes. Regardless of how great a visual novel's story may be, a blank text description can never replace a scene where I can see the character models or an animated cutscene. I felt their absence strongly by the end of the game. If you haven't noticed yet, I've avoided talking about the other half of the gameplay loop, the combat. So let's get into what's easily the biggest blemish on what otherwise would have been a great game. When you're not busy being a high schooler with friends, extracurricular activities, and a part-time job, you're entering the Dark Hour, a period of time that's only known to you and other Persona users. Here, you visit Tartarus, the main dungeon of the game. Unlike the different dungeons you encounter over the course of Persona 5, you're down to just one here, and it's a shame that Tartarus is... Tartarus is composed of small, randomly generated floors that you climb up by finding the staircase on each floor. Shadows wander about, leaving them open to be attacked by the back, granting an advantage in combat. If the shadows spot you first and collide with you, you're at a disadvantage. Combat progresses like a normal turn-based battle, where you focus on using the elemental weaknesses of your enemies to win the fight. Sometimes at the end of a battle, you're given the opportunity for an extra bonus, like money or extra experience points. What I've just described is an average run-through a floor of Tartarus. Find the staircase, fight enemies, and sometimes find some treasure. Every now and then, a floor may have a special condition that adds some much-needed variety, such as fog with limited visibility, enemies that grant you more items, etc. But that's Tartarus, and what you do on the first 10 floors is exactly what you're going to be doing on the last 10 floors, with no significant difference whatsoever. This is footage of one of the first floors of Tartarus, and one of the last floors. Can you tell which is which? The environmental changes can be interesting, but they're inconsistent. There's no natural sense of progression with the different blocks of Tartarus, like some degradation or corruption as you ascend. Some blocks do stand out like the early second block that's riddled with bloodstains. The only functional difference as you climb up are different enemies and a change in the appearance and music every 50 or so floors, but even the enemies start getting recycled. Without knowing the exact number, I would wager there's about 10 to 15 different enemies you'll see, with harder variants being represented by recolors. I don't know the exact division of gameplay regarding Tartarus and everything else, but if I had to guess, I'd wager about 40 to 50% of your time will be spent here. That's 30 to 40 hours of doing the exact same thing with familiar environments to familiar enemies. I enjoy the gameplay loop of Persona enough for this to have never felt like a chore, but damn if that feeling didn't creep up on many occasions. In the overworld, despite doing the same thing on a daily basis, the time management means that you're constantly thinking about your decisions, and engaging with the world and all of the options laid in front of you. You could teach a chimpanzee to play through Tartarus, and watching the chimp play would probably be more entertaining than doing it yourself. One of the bonuses you might encounter at the end of a battle is a booster for XP, and when given the choice, I selected that option 90% of the time, because I I knew it would reduce the possibility of grinding in the future. The only time I looked forward to Tartarus was when I received a new party member or persona that I wanted to try out. That's not even to mention the obscene difficulty curve that you'll run into during your battles. I was playing on hard mode because I felt that Persona 5 on normal was a bit too easy during the second half of the game. So your mileage may vary depending on how much bullshit the game will throw at you, but I imagine that regardless of the difficulty selected, you'll still find a bullshit difficulty curve. For you, it'll just be a curve from easy to tough instead of what I had, which was challenging to absolute complete f***ery. <laughs> The normal encounters are a pretty fair challenge. You can get through most of them with no trouble so long as you make the right choices and exploit enemy weaknesses whenever you can. If you make a mistake and select the wrong option, you open yourself up to powerful attacks that could wipe your party in one turn. I didn't mind these very much, since many of my deaths during regular battles were due to me not making the correct choice of attack. And death is quite forgiving in this game, since you have the option of restarting at whatever floor of Tartarus you died at, rather than being reset back to your save point. Most of my deaths were my fault. Some of them were not. We need you! Please! Oh no! This could be much more punishing if you linger on a floor for too long, but I usually never did since I tried climbing Tartarus at a pretty quick pace, while also focusing on enough frequent battles so my party wasn't underleveled. I never felt grossly underleveled in Tartarus until I ran into the mini-bosses that you'll find every 15 or so floors. These fights were more than just difficult. Some of them were just borderline unfair. If they weren't taking you down in one hit, then they would use status effects that would render your party worthless. At one specific fight around the first half of the game, I won because of some bizarre logic 
logic with the enemy AI, where they stopped using the ability that would turn my entire party against each other. I think it may have had something to do with my refusal to use magic, but for whatever reason, I got through the fight that was completely crushing me without doing anything differently. In some fights, it was a better strategy to keep your other party members dead so you wouldn't waste a turn reviving them, instead opting to continue the fight with whichever member was still standing. You can't rely on typical elemental weaknesses for the mini bosses, since they'll rarely be vulnerable, so you'll have to rely on critical hits, healing, and buffs and debuffs. In that regard, I do commend the mini bosses for regularly forcing the player out of their comfort zone, which is always what a good boss should do. But many of them take it a step too far. The mini boss fights among the first third of the game are the worst, since you're lacking incredibly helpful healing and buff spells that you don't start unlocking until the second half of the game. The later mini bosses are much more tolerable, since you'll have more party members and greater persona available to you, which will significantly open up your options and capability for these fights. In that regard, the mini bosses early on almost feel like they're designed to weed players out. Of all the mini boss fights, I think there was only one that I was able to complete on my first try. Every other one required at least two to five attempts to successfully complete, with some taking upwards of almost 10 different attempts. Some of you might think that I was just under leveled for these fights, and my issue would have been resolved if I had just done a little bit of grinding, but I don't think that's the case. And my main evidence of that can be found in the actual main bosses. There's about 10 or so primary boss fights that you'll typically encounter once a month in the game, and I found these encounters to be much more engaging than the mini boss fights in Tartarus. They sometimes had a unique combat mechanic, like two bosses fusing into one, or a fight that involved targeting specific points before being able to hurt the primary boss. These fights are a major improvement. I was also able to beat all of these fights on my first try, as opposed to the mini bosses, but they never felt like cakewalks. I still had to play carefully to win the fights, and the challenge increased gradually as the the game went by. Perhaps a couple of these fights could have done with a slightly higher difficulty, but overall the challenge that these provided was interesting and didn't make me want to throw myself at my TV. The balancing for bosses feels almost backwards, although after the first main boss, I knew that if I could get past the mini bosses that were available to me before the primary boss, then I never had to worry about being underleveled for the main boss. On that note, I said that I knew that if I could get past the mini bosses that were available to me before the primary boss. An interesting thing to mention regarding Tartarus is that there is no actual requirement or Pace that you have to climb up the tower. Once you've climbed high enough per month, you reach a gate that won't open until the main boss of that month is defeated. As far as I could research from 10 year old guides, the only requirement for Tartarus is that you have to be at the top by the end of the game for the final boss. It's ballsy for the developers to leave something so important to be completely up to the player's choice. And it almost adds to the school experience, since managing your visits at Tartarus is as important as your decision making during the day. True to a real school experience, you can procrastinate all your time at Tartarus and make your life a living hell for the end of the school year. Let's take a positivity break. We've still got a ways to go, so let's stop and smell the roses and appreciate life. Did you get enough sleep last night? I got pretty good sleep. I hope you did. Do I like this game? What do I think of the final boss and ending? Am I a fan of tomato soup? These questions will be answered eventually. Tartarus may be the biggest issue in Persona 3, but it's not the only one. While I enjoyed the narrative of the game, I also felt that a little more could have been done to spice things up to engage with it more. For much of the game, it felt like there was just moments of waiting for the next thing to happen. It never felt like the player had much agency or urgency with the developments of the plot, at least early on. It almost feels like you're a participant in the journey, rather than the active leader looking to make a change or accomplish a goal. There is a goal, but that leads into another issue. The phrase, oh, the game gets good at blank hours, is thrown thrown around a lot to excuse games with a terrible introduction and first act, but I think that phrase is applicable here, but not as an excuse. I felt that the game's introduction is incredibly weak, providing no real motivation or guidance to the player. I don't mean that the game is lacking a tutorial, but it needs some goal or hook that just isn't found. For the first chunk of the game, I didn't really understand the need to go to Tartarus. There was no urgency or draw, and there was no compelling plot or conflict developing during the day that grabbed my attention. The introduction of the main bosses does help to build momentum. You also gain access to side quests somewhere around the 5 to 10 hour mark, which were incredibly useful for providing motivation regarding climbing Tartarus. Some of the side quests had deadlines for completion in order to obtain a reward, with many of them involving reaching certain checkpoints in Tartarus before a certain date. So that provided a much needed sense of urgency and motivation when it came to the dungeon crawling. It's just a shame that the game didn't introduce this in the first few hours, as that could have improved the pacing. While the player motivation and routine becomes more fulfilled after the first few main bosses, the narrative doesn't truly start gaining momentum until around the halfway 
day mark. That's nearly 30 hours of playtime before I started engaging with the narrative. The intrigue of the plot becomes much more clear once more party members were introduced, which is a welcome change of pace, but also a disappointment that the first half of the game feels very shallow in terms of interesting plot and character development. Some of the best character and plot moments are found in the second half of the game, which makes sense for a long-form story such as this, but it's a shame that the first half feels so lacking and empty as a result. A few party members could have stood to have much more character moments and development. I also think that at the very least, there should have been more interactions with the party early on. I understand the characters weren't totally familiar and comfortable with one another yet, but I think that could have possibly led to interesting conflicts and moments of discourse and tension within the group early on. Instead, a lot of the chemistry of the early party reminded me of when you were forced into a group project from school without your friends. You'll get your work done and maybe make some small talk, but it never goes beyond that. And for Persona 3, it never felt like it progressed beyond that small talk awkwardness until the halfway point. There were some exceptions, but they were very few. I can't remember them easily. When the themes of death and life connect and the characters engage with them, the narrative is at its best. It's just a shame that the first act of the game lacks meaningful moments to keep the player interested. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that, while I found myself engaged with the game's mechanics and routine after about five hours due to my love for Persona 5, I didn't find the plot interesting until the halfway point, which is a big issue. I wouldn't fault any player for losing interest in this game before completing it. Another lacking point is the antagonist you'll run into on occasion. Again, just like the rest of the narrative, these characters aren't introduced until close to the halfway mark of the game, or at least that's how I remember. If they're introduced earlier, they don't start having a large impact on the plot until much later. This villainous group is pretty boring and don't offer a meaningful foil to our heroes, except for one who has some actual depth and development over the course of the story. While I would have liked for her story to have a bit more time spent on it, I enjoyed watching it and her relationship that she develops with one of your party members. It services the greater themes of the story while adding depth to your party member. The other two villains are forgettable and predictable. You can tell exactly where the story is going for one of them the second you see them on screen. At the very least, they have some fun and memorable designs, and that compliment extends to all the other characters. Shigenori Soejima has been the primary character designer for the Persona franchise since 3, and his work is as great with Persona 3 as it's ever been. One of the greatest strengths in Persona is the character design, which does a lot of heavy lifting for the game's personality alongside the music and voice work. Before moving on to talking about the final boss of the game, I'd like to provide a spoiler warning if you're sensitive. I won't be revealing the identity of the final boss, nor going into any plot details. I'll be talking in vague terms about some mechanics of the fight as well as my experience, but I won't go into any heavy detail that would ruin the surprise of the fight. If you're extra sensitive and don't want any preparation or knowledge, then you're welcome to skip to the timestamp. Ready? The final boss can kiss my f***ing ass. What a colossal, obnoxious, frustrating sh piece of sh** is what I would have said if I hadn't been able to complete the fight. My opinions on this are complicated, but overall positive. The final boss is a true test of many of the mechanics and attacks you've seen throughout the game. You'll be hit with every element type and be subjected to nearly every status effect. It's also the hardest fight in the main game. In those two regards, and with hindsight of having completed the fight, it feels like a proper challenge that would befit a final boss. There's one glaring issue, though, that every fan of Persona 3 is aware of. This fight is long. Way, way too long. My successful attempt at the fight took me about 40 to 45 minutes to complete, and that's not counting any narrative or cutscenes or dialogue. This fight is a brutal marathon that demands your patience. The final boss has multiple health bars, with the last health bar being over 10 times the length of the previous ones, making the last phase feel just as long as all the phases that came before. If you try to rush this fight early on without taking the extra steps and using proper buffing and defensive skills, you'll be wiped out early. Your party could have full health, but you could very easily lose the fight in one turn with enough bad luck on your side, and that's precisely what happened to me the first time I attempted it. Ask anyone who's died in this fight before reaching the final phase, and they'll tell you the same thing. It's because the boss landed a bullshit critical hit that allowed them to keep taking more turns and wipe you out completely. It's disheartening to lose over 30 minutes of progress in a fight over a turn that seemed completely unavoidable, and that's what happened to me constantly for my first three or four attempts. Despite changing persona and party members to try new strategies, I was nearly ready to lower the difficulty or just write this review without completing the fight, but my stubbornness won over me. There were three crucial elements to winning this fight, and if you decide to experience this hellscape marathon on hard difficulty like I did, remember my advice. Level up. I was underleveled for this fight, which led to the boss landing way more critical hits and winning quickly. About an hour's worth of grinding and five levels later for my party made a significant significant difference in my performance. If the fight feels like a lost cause, you'd be surprised the difference that a bit of grinding makes. Focus on defense. 
Through the game, I collected some items that grant immunity to certain elements. For example, I gave the lightning immunity item to a party member that was only weak to lightning. This led to a party that had almost no elemental weaknesses for the boss to exploit. Try and cut down the boss's advantages as much as possible. The less weaknesses for them to exploit, the less turns they can take. The less turns, the less likely they can kill you. This makes a giant difference. Use mini boss consumables. Do you remember those awful mini bosses that had an unbelievably sharp difficulty curve? They drop items that give flat stat boosts to the main player's persona. Save these for the end when you have your final persona and use all of these items. Increase your luck and other stats. If you can level up one of your persona to have strength or magic that's at least 90, you'll be able to dish out a healthy amount of damage. The more damage you can dish out safely, the quicker you'll get through the boss. The quicker you can take down each phase, the less turns they'll have to attack. Only attack when you're properly shielded and equipped with the right persona. After leveling up for a bit and using the mini boss consumables, I defeated the final boss in what I would say was a tough and long fight, but not nearly as unfair and impossible as before. The difficulty isn't as bad as I originally thought, but that doesn't excuse the unforgiving length. This fight could be trimmed in half and you wouldn't lose anything of value, and it's a major blemish on what is otherwise an amazing ending. For all all my faults, this game's ending and final act worked incredibly well. The build-up to the final conflict had tremendous atmosphere that was wonderfully set with Shoji Maguro's incredible music. It's a shame that the static visuals couldn't match the music, but the tone and atmosphere was still great. The final boss, when it wasn't bullshit, was a fitting challenge, and the ending was emotional in a meaningful way. Without spoiling any details, there's a playable conclusion after the final boss, and I love the feeling that the game leaves you with right up to the ending. After the final scene and the cut to credits, I was genuinely surprised with the note the game ends on. I imagine that some players may find it a bit disappointing or lackluster, but I disagree, and I think the final moments of the game perfectly capture the overarching themes about life and death perfectly. It doesn't hurt that the final ending theme, Kimi no Kyoku, or Memories of You, is incredible. Despite having finished the game a few days ago, I must have replayed that song at least 20 times now. I can't get it out of my head, and it ends with the game on a beautiful note that stays with me. Fans of the Persona series highlight 3 as having one of the most memorable endings, and while I've only played Persona 5 and Strikers, I can easily say that 3's ending left a much greater impression on me. There's many other minor issues that I have with Persona 3 that aren't present in Persona 5. I'm not bringing these points up to illustrate the flaws with Persona 3, but rather showing that the developers behind these games are making great decisions with every new iteration. They've shown good judgment with their improvements from 3 to 5, and it makes me hopeful for the remake of 3 that it'll improve upon many issues most of them during combat, such as... In combat, you're unable to check the status of your party's buffs without first selecting a consumable item and cycling through them, or using a spell that only targets a single member. This is clunky and awkward. You can't stack buffs or extend them. If three of your party members have attack up and you use the spell to increase attack for all of your party, only one of the members will receive the buff while the rest are wasted. The rest of them may very well run out of the buff in the next turn, and you have to repeat the process again. This process is avoidable if you carefully check every party member before you using a buff, but that's also clunky. The game doesn't give you a visual indicator or reminder when you've already analyzed the target, so you'll likely repeat the process since you'll forget whether or not you've already done so over the course of a battle. Or maybe that's just me and my forgetful brain. When selecting a new persona, the game won't give you details regarding the cost of abilities until after you've already selected them, and once you've made a selection in one turn, you can't change your mind. This is a problem when you're swapping persona and you're low on magic, and you can't remember the exact cost for every single ability. From my experience, you're seemingly more likely to receive shuffle cards after using an all-out attack, so you're compelled to constantly go for them. They're the optimal way of winning fights, but their charm wears out very quickly, and you'll be seeing this animation hundreds of times over the course of the game. The side quests aren't perfect, with one set revolving around a specific civilian to rescue within Tartarus. This wouldn't be annoying except for the way Tartarus spaces out checkpoints, and the fact that you can't descend floors. You can only climb. There were many times where I had to climb 10 to 15 floors just to find someone located somewhere on the last five floors because I couldn't warp to a checkpoint ahead and climb down. I don't think that change would have been a problem or caused some kind of balance issue within Tartarus, but maybe I'm just naive. I think being able to climb down floors in Tartarus could have helped a lot with some side quests without taking away any of the challenge. When fusing Persona, the new Persona you create will inherit some abilities from the previous ones. If you don't like the randomly selected abilities you're given, you can re select the fusible persona to generate different ones. This is more of an exploit than an issue, but it can be pretty annoying when you want a specific ability and you're a stubborn bastard like me, who will reselect over and over again to get the best abilities. Yes, I do like tomato soup. 
It's best when you dip other stuff in it though, like grilled cheese. It's clunky to have to access the fast travel menu just to select one option. There's very little to do at night, especially once you've maxed out the social links that are available. After that, I spend a majority of my time in what I would have probably done in real life, going to the arcade. You're given stat boosts, which are nice, and resulted in my having a persona that did ridiculous magic damage by the end of the game. That was pretty satisfying, but still, your options for activities in the evening are severely limited. On Sundays, you'll receive phone calls from your friends asking to hang out, but you won't know who's gonna call. So if you're expecting a call from someone specific, you'll have to reject the first calls. You may not get the call you want, and you can't change your mind once you've declined a previous person. There's no way to contact them or find them in the overworld. What's more, if you do decide to spend time with them, you forego watching the Sunday morning shopping channel, which gives you a chance of buying potentially rare items. It feels silly that you're forced to make a choice when both options feel totally plausible. I don't see why you can't watch some morning TV before going to the movies with your buddy, unless your friends are waiting at your door for you to come out the second you say yes to them, which is a very disturbing image. These may seem like minor nitpicks, but they do stack up to a level of annoyance that permeates many of the game's systems. But I'd like to say again that I'm not mentioning these as a criticism of this game. As many of these issues, I was able to tolerate just fine. These are worth bringing up, because almost all of these issues either don't exist or have been completely fixed in Persona 5. Which leads me to the elephant in the room, Persona 3 Reload. Persona 3 has a lot of untapped greatness laying dormant within, much like the nature of Persona themselves. The visual improvements to the remake are an obvious first step, and they'll do a lot for improving immersion in the world as well as the strong emotional beats of the story. These improvements will be even greater when compared to the static nature of Persona 3 Portable compared to the previous releases. Some more activities could be added to the overworld, which would be a nice touch, but not required. What would be much more important is greatly changing the activities that are available to you in the evening, or making the dorm a much more engaging space. The only thing the dorm is good for is walking the dog or your bedroom which lets you study or sleep early for a stat boost. Some interactivity within the dorm and your party members would breathe a lot of life for it. I don't think the story needs a whole lot of changing, but extra dialogue between the party early on would help tremendously, as well as the goals and motivations of the player being more explicitly defined. I don't think this would require a tremendous amount of work, but I'm not so sure on this one. Simplifying and streamlining combat and personas will go a long way towards fixing the tedium regarding battles. Speaking of battles, Tartarus is the biggest blemish of the original game, and it would need a pretty significant overhaul. The easiest improvement is dialing back the difficulty curve on the mini-bosses, at least on hard mode based on my experiences. I also think fixing the XP you get from many bosses would help. I think the most insulting thing about the fights from the original isn't the difficulty, but the laughably small experience you would get from the challenge. A normal battle with a decent XP booster card could give you double the experience and be cleared in under a minute. The hardest change would be to make exploring Tartarus more dynamic. Making each block feel even more distinct would go a long way, and a greater variety in floor layouts would help with that, rather than randomly generated hallways. Some extra activities or optional objectives that could be completed, as well as new disturbances and events that occur on each floor would be a welcome change. Tartarus has very far to go, so any change would be a welcome one. It would take forever to list potential improvements, so I'm excited to see where they go with it. I didn't love Persona 3 like I did Persona 5. It's hard to ignore the limitations when it comes to presentation compared to the dazzling modern game. But beyond that, there are too many issues with the gameplay and story to prevent it from greatness. But Persona 3 does have something that I do love, and something that Persona 5 didn't have for me. I love the feeling that Persona 3 leaves you with. Persona 5 had a perfectly fitting end to the story, but it wasn't incredible or all that surprising. My love for the game surrounds the whole package, and it's still my recommended starting point for the franchise. I wouldn't recommend Persona 3 Portable for someone looking to jump into the franchise, but despite my issues, I'm still thinking about the game in a way that I wasn't with Persona 5. The ending leaves you on a melancholy, hopeful, emotional, and empty feeling all at once. It's one that I won't spoil at all, and it's worth experiencing for yourself if you're still interested. I would recommend Persona 3 Portable to anyone who really liked Persona 5 and are looking for more of that gameplay loop. You may have similar gripes that I do from the lack of quality of life features of Persona 5, but I imagine you'll enjoy the game fine. If possible, I'd suggest getting the game for the Switch or Steam Deck, and so far that logic applies to all of these games. The handheld nature suits these games and their calendar gameplay systems very well, and provides an extra addicting quality. I think Atlas is aware of this too, given that Persona 3 Portable and Persona 4 Golden were originally released for handheld devices. It's still a gigantic mystery why it took them so long to release the game for the Nintendo Switch. 
These games are perfectly playable on other consoles and PC. My playthrough of Persona 5 and Strikers was on the PS4, but I'd still recommend a handheld over a console, whenever possible. Fans of Persona 3 are diehard, and I can see what it is that they adore about this game. The tone of the world it presents and the themes of the story are incredible when they're at their best, but I believe further greatness awaits. If Persona wasn't a respectable and well-known name in the gaming industry before 2016, Persona 5 rebelled against that status quo and earned itself the legendary reputation that it still upholds. But that reputation starts with the groundwork that Persona 3 laid forth. Despite spending nearly 90 hours in this world, the ending leaves me wanting to return to the newly realized Dark Hour all over again. I believe in the creative team behind the series to fully realize the potential of what this world could be with Persona 3 Reload, unlocking a greatness that not only stands alongside its sister games of Persona 4 and 5, but even perhaps surpassing them to earn its long overdue recognition. <laughs> Thank you.